This is breaking news. Governor Cuomo is giving an update on coronavirus in New York. Let's go to that now. New Yorkers over 18 have received one dose already. And the percentage of people who come back for the second dose is very, very high. Uh, over half the population, 52%, fully vaccinated now. But we still have more work to do on vaccinations. The numbers on the vaccinations are the only number uh, that is not doing as well as the others. Part of that is common sense. The people who were most eager to get a, get a vaccine came in and got it. And now we're getting towards a percentage of the population that's not that eager to get the vaccine. And then you have a subgroup that is just uh, reluctant and hesitant to get it. We started a new program because these are times to be creative and, and do things you've never done before. The MTA's Get a Shot, Take a Ride program. Theory is you're going into the subway, you're going onto a train. Uh, we will have the vaccines in the station. So you literally walk right past the vaccination to get on the train. And if you get a vaccination, then uh, you will get a, a free pass on the subway or the Long Island Railroad or on Metro North. So a financial incentive to get it. We tried it last week, 5,700 vaccinations in five days. So it worked very well. And it was a pilot. We had never done it before. We're going to extend it because it's worked well. Some stations worked better than other stations. We're going to extend uh, the stations you see there, East 180th, 180th Street in the Bronx, Grand Central, Penn Station, Broadway, and we're going to add 125th Street in Harlem, Sutphin Boulevard, Queens, my old neighborhood, Hicksville on Long Island, uh, and Broadway Junction we're, we're keeping. So, uh, this works, and we're going to find more creative ways to get people to take vaccines, because the more people take vaccines, the better, period. That's what it's all about. But New Yorkers have made tremendous progress. New Yorkers have made more progress than any state in the United States of America. How can I say that? Because we had a worse problem than any state in the United States of America. Remember, we had the highest infection rate on the globe at one time. When COVID hit us, it hit us as an ambush. It had been coming here for months and nobody knew. And by the time we figured it out, it was too late. Why? Because people fly into New York. COVID came to New York, not from China. COVID came from Europe to New York. And those flights from Europe were landing in New York. And COVID had gone from China to Europe. Everybody missed it. And then people had it in Europe and were coming to New York. And everybody missed it until it was too late. We had people dying from COVID before we knew we had COVID. So New Yorkers have made great progress. All the arrows are now pointed in the right direction. So let's get back to life. This shutdown has caused all sorts of damage, damage that we're not even aware of. Everybody points to the economic damage, and that's, that's certain. Businesses closed, people lost their jobs, but there's all sorts of other damage that people are not yet understanding, I believe. What did it mean to keep children out of, a school, out of school for a year? The lack of socialization, the lack of developing friendships and bonds. What did it mean to say to people, you can't hug, you can't kiss? What did it say to senior citizens who were basically trapped in their homes, you can't visit your family? You have to be worried about everyone you see, the psychological trauma, the mental health trauma. Divorces are up about 300% across the globe from this situation. So 
we have to reopen. We have to reopen smart. We have to reopen with a cautious eye, but we have to get back to life and we have to get back to life and living and we have to do it the way New Yorkers do it. We have to do it quickly and robustly. Effective this Wednesday, we're going to adopt the CDC's new guidance and regulations on masks and social distancing for vaccinated people. By the CDC guidance, immunocompromised people and vaccinated people should continue to wear a mask and social distance. But uh, if you are vaccinated, uh, you are safe, no masks, no social distancing. Uh, we're also going to follow the CDC's guidelines that you will still need to wear a mask on public transportation, the subways, the buses, nursing homes, homeless shelters, correctional facilities, schools, and health care facilities. Uh, the CDC guidance is all up on the website. Individual private venues still have the ability to add additional guidelines to the state guidelines and the CDC guidelines. But for our part, we're adopting the CDC and we're saying, let's open. Uh, this comes at a good time for New York because we had already said we were gonna do our major reopening this Wednesday. So this Wednesday, uh, most capacity restrictions are lifted in the tri-state area, New Jersey, Connecticut. Whenever possible, we work with New Jersey and Connecticut to make sure we're doing the same thing. We don't want people going from New York to New Jersey, New Jersey to New York. Uh, well, we do, but not to get around COVID guidelines, not to shop COVID guidelines. Outdoor food and beverage curfew is lifted today. Indoor food and beverage lifted May 31st. Outdoor gathering increased to 500. Indoor 250. Indoor residential gathering to 50. 24-hour subway service has returned. Getting back to life means not just getting back to work, but getting back to life the way we enjoy it in New York. Why people enjoy being here. What makes New York, New York. And part of that is sports. And congratulations to the Knicks and the Nets on making the playoffs. That is really good news. Uh, I am going to root for New York, just so you know. Uh, the rules on the playoffs. There will be a vaccinated section and an unvaccinated section. We've just done this for the Islanders. Uh, currently, from the Islanders model that we used, which we're now uh, applying to the Knicks and the Nets, it's 50% of the arena is for vaccinated people, 50% for unvaccinated people. Uh, unvaccinated people have to do six feet social distancing and require a mask. But this is up to the individual venue, just to be clear. Uh, if I own the Knicks, can I tell you what I would do if I own the Knicks? Everybody else tells you what they would do if they own the Knicks, right? That's true. <laughs> Everybody is entitled to an opinion. If I own the Knicks, uh, yeah, the guidelines are 50% uh, for vaccinated. I would go higher. I encourage operators and venues to go higher than 50% vaccinated. You can go to 100% vaccinated. That's in a private operator's control. And frankly, from the state's point of view, we want to encourage people to get vaccinated. Yes, there are health reasons, but we're opening up and we're opening up with more opportunities to vaccinated people. So it's another reason to get vaccinated. And if the Knicks or the Nets say 60%, 75%, 80% for vaccinated people, why would they say that? Because they get more attendance. You get more people in the arena in a vaccinated section than the unvaccinated, because the unvaccinated, you have to have the six foot social distancing. From the team's point of view, the teams want fans in the arena, 
right? Ty Cobb, the fans make the game. They want the cheers. They want the energy. The, the players themselves want it. So the more people in the arena, the better. Uh, and that is within their control. New York City Marathon. It's another great New York City institution. Uh, we have Karen Hempel with us. Uh, the marathon is back. And that is a great, great New York event that excites people from all across the globe, does a lot of great work for the city and the state of New York. Many people come. It'll be at 60% capacity, 33,000 runners. They'll have health and safety guidelines. Registration opens on June 8th. Uh, and again, the race isn't until November 7th, but it's the 50th running. And that can be adjusted between now and November because November is a long way away. But uh, for now, for the opening registration, it's uh, 33,000 runners. County fairs, a big part of this state, big part of upstate New York. They are all allowed to open up to the capacity of six feet social distancing. The local Department of Health will issue a permit. New York State Department of Health approves events over 5,000. Private operator can again set their own rules or a government owned venue can set additional rules. And Tribeca Film Festival is going to reopen. Uh, talk about everything comes around. Tribeca was formed post 9-11. Post 9-11, I don't know how many of you are old enough to remember, there were so many naysayers about New York post 9-11. It's over for New York. We're a terrorist target. Everybody's going to flee New York. Uh, nobody wants to stay here because now we're an ongoing target. Going downtown, forget it. You couldn't get people to go downtown. What was the logic? I have no idea. What did you think? There was going to be another terrorist attack and it was going to happen to be downtown again? But the, the esprit de corps of New York, the confidence in New York was gone. Tribeca was formed to bring back the New York spirit, to bring back what New Yorkers loved about New York. And it did it brilliantly. That was the founding of Tribeca, to help New York rejuvenate post 9-11. And Tribeca is now helping New York rejuvenate post COVID. This is about re rekindling the spirit of New York. Yeah, you can open buses, you can open subways, you can open businesses, but we need to get the exuberance back, the excitement back, the love of New York. I love New York. I love New York. Why are you in New York? Because I love New York. It's that emotion. It's that spirit. And that's what we're getting back that, yeah, we're New York tough. Yeah, we went through a tough time. Yes, COVID was tough, but we're tougher. We're better. That's the New York spirit. That's the New York mojo. Tribeca will open on June 9th at a new park that we're opening on Manhattan West Side, Pier 76, which is magnificent. It's a new public space. It goes right out into the Hudson, magnificent views. And uh, Tribeca on their opening on June 9th will uh, host a screening on Pier 76 for Lin-Manuel Miranda's In the Heights. And the closing night of Tribeca is June 19th. It's going to be right here with a red carpet closing night performance at the magnificent Radio City Music Hall. 100% vaccinated, mask free audience. This beautiful hall will be filled once again with what I am sure 
is going to be a phenomenal, phenomenal evening and attraction. Having Radio City back at 100%, without masks, with people enjoying New York and the New York arts, is going to be not only symbol symbolic and metaphoric, but I think it's going to go a long way towards uh, bringing back this state overall. And we do want to say directly, 100% at Radio City Music Hall. So if I'm not vaccinated, I can't go. That's right. That's right. The whole point of the CDC's change, the whole point of our change, is to say to people, there are benefits to being vaccinated. Number one, if you get COVID, which there's a fractional chance that you get it if you're vaccinated, you won't get as sick. Number two, you can't transmit it to anyone. And number three, yes, New York is opening, but you're going to have more opportunities if you are vaccinated. And yes, if you're vaccinated and you go to a ball game, you sit in a vaccinated section and you sit next to your buddies and your friends. If you're unvaccinated, you have to sit six feet apart. If you're vaccinated, yes, you come to Radio City Music Hall. And if you're unvaccinated, that's your choice. But uh, you can't go into the Radio City Music Hall with vaccinated people. For Radio City Music Hall to do this is so powerful because you have to remember, history repeats itself. Radio City Music Hall is not just an iconic venue. It was built by John Rockefeller when, in the middle of the Depression. Why? Because we were in the middle of the Depression. Why would you build this amazing futuristic music hall in the middle of the Depression? Because we were in the middle of the Depression. And Rockefeller's vision was, let's build something that inspires and shows hope. Why did Governor Smith build the Empire State Building in the middle of the Great Depression? That's when you're gonna build the tallest building? Of course that's when I'm gonna build the tallest building. Because we are in the middle of the Depression and we want that building to rise because we want those spirits to rise. Yes, says Rockefeller, I'm going to build an awesome music hall, better than anything you've ever seen before, because that's the statement that I want to make. The largest auditorium in the world, the biggest stage uh, built for the ages with technology never deployed before. They did that in that moment to make that statement because they were faced with a challenge, but they wanted to stand up to that challenge. And that's the message we have to remember today. People ask me all day long, what is New York going to be like post COVID? What do you think? We determine what New York is going to be like. There's no pre-written destiny here. You tell me what we do, I will tell you what we are post-COVID. It will be what we make it to be. And what music, Radio City Music Hall says is, imagine what you want it to be, and then build that. Two steps, imagine a better New York and then make it happen. And we will imagine a better New York because New York was not perfect pre-COVID. We want to go back to the day before COVID. No, we don't. I don't. I want to go back to a New York that never was. Let's build a New York that is bigger and bolder and safer and sweeter and cleaner and safer 
and more just than ever before. This is the moment to do it because the table has been reset. Every governor, every mayor, every country on the globe needs to recover from COVID and needs to transform themselves for a post-COVID world. Who wins that competition? Who's ever smarter, faster, and more entrepreneurial? Whoever has a better imagination and more vision, that's who wins. And you know what that is? That is the definition of what makes New York, New York, and what makes New Yorkers, New Yorkers, and why we built the Empire State Building, and why we built Radio City Music Hall, and why we started the Tribeca Film Festival. Because you can knock us down, but we're going to get up, and we're going, going to get up smarter and stronger and more united than ever before. That is us. That's who we are. It's in our DNA. It's what we mean by New York tough. Otherwise, you don't make it in this place. We have and we will, and we'll do it together. Thank you for being here. And with that, let me turn it over to Jane Rosenthal to speak about the Tribeca Film Festival. Thank you, Governor. What an exciting and hopeful day. Um, it's really an honor to be with you. And Jim, congratulations on the Knicks. We've been through a grueling year, and it's been devastating, frustrating, at times frightening. We've missed each other and the opportunity to be together, to watch a movie, to dance, laugh, and sing like right here on this stage. Bob De Niro and I started the festival 19 years ago, as the governor said in the aftermath of 9-11, with the purpose of bringing people back downtown. Not unlike today, there was a need to rebuild and reimagine New York. We wanted to unite and bring people together from all over the city, the country, and the world. Now, in the wake of another crisis, our founding mission is even more relevant today than, and that it was more relevant today. This year, we want to ensure that we can reach all corners of New York. Today, we're thrilled to be able to bring the Tribeca Film Festival to all five boroughs as a tribute to storytelling and cultural rich richness of every part of New York and to share our festival experience safely while supporting local businesses. Today's announcement is a huge milestone. It marks the first time in over a year that people will be able to gather together in this extraordinary venue. This would not be possible without your incredible leadership, Governor, so thank you as we continue to fight this war against COVID. The Tribeca Film Festival will be the first in-person festival to take place in North America since the pandemic. Our opening night will be in the Heights, and we'll be screening in the Heights at the, um, at the Palace Theater in Washington Heights. And simultaneously, we're going to be screening in eight other screens from the Bronx, Pier 76, to the Battery, to Brooklyn, to Staten Island. And everyone, the tickets will be free, and, but you do have to make a reservation to book your pod. So I hope everyone will join us. As the governor has pushed us to do so many times, it's about reimagining. We never believed we'd be doing all of these extraordinary outdoor venues, basically creating an outdoor multiplex here in New York. So thank you so much, Governor, for pushing us. Um, uh, the In the Heights is the quintessential New York tough story of hard work, resilience, and triumph, the very foundation of New York City. Thank you. You've been a tremendous supporter of the arts, and we're so grateful for your friendship and partnership. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jane, and thank you for everything that you've done uh, all through this, and you will do with Tribeca. Uh, now it's my pleasure to turn it over to Mr. James Dolan, congratulations on the Knicks. Go Knicks. Go Knicks. Uh, and uh, congratulations on this opening today. Thank you for having us, Jim. Thank you, Governor. The, uh, well, this is what we've been waiting for. <laughs> uh, been waiting for 14 months for this. The, uh, 
I remember sitting in my in my apartment back in uh, the end of March last year, the, um, when we didn't know anything about this virus, and I and I had gotten it. And I, I felt terrible, but they, they, they told me, well, you can't come out um, until you test negative, right? Which is very different than the guidance to give you today. 35 days it took me to test negative. The, uh, that apartment smelled terrible on day 35, <laughs> I'll tell you what. <laughs> Simply put, today is a game changer. It's a game changer for our venues. It's a game changer for entertainment for sports and for New York. This is what we've been waiting for, New York, the, to bring the culture back, to bring the spirit back to New York. And the governor's announcement today is, is the moment that we can really start to do it. It's a way to get back to doing the things that we love, the things that we're here to do, and what the city needs us to do. The, uh, that's the role that Madison Square Garden and Radio City and the Beacon Theater, et cetera, that's part of our role here. The, the, we're part of the culture and the heart of New York City, and we're, and we're ready to go. And we want to thank Governor Cuomo for his leadership in making that happen. Right. Great job. Right. Festival's closing event here at Radio City is going to be very special, as Jane told you. We look forward to working with her and her team to make it unforgettable for all who attend, all who attend being vaccinated. So at this very moment, we're turning on the lights. We're going to immediately, and I've actually started this morning, starting call, making phone calls, start to book concerts at our venues uh, that we we anticipate will make for a blockbuster summer, which is really different because we didn't think this was going to happen. We, the, we were really planning on a blockbuster fall. So thank you. The, the, uh, and we'll get, we're going to get right to it. And later on, the, not today, but soon, we will be announcing a slate of concerts. The, the, uh, but I'm telling you now, as the governor said, get vaccinated. Because if you don't get vaccinated, your chances of going to, to participate in this great summer are going to be either non-existent or greatly diminished. The, the, and it's important because you got to have, you have to have two weeks, right, Governor? Yes. Right. So, you know, we're starting the book now. Go today and get your vaccination so that when these shows come, for when the Knicks make it to the second round, oh, I hope, the, um, <laughs> the, the, uh, you can come. The, the, uh, and we'll have a seat for you. The, um, but first, we're going to look forward to an exciting Knicks playoff run with a lot more people. And for Knicks home playoff games, we're shooting to have more than 13,000 fans at the Garden, the majority of whom will be sitting in vaccinated sections, shoulder to shoulder. Our fans have been extremely loyal and have helped drive the team's success. I'm just noting that many of you, any of you who know about basketball know the concept of the sixth man in the home court. We've been missing our sixth man, and we've done as well as we've done without our sixth man, but we're getting our sixth man back for the playoffs, so we're going to be even better. Um, and it's going to be it's going to be so much fun and so loud at the Garden. So come, tickets are going to be are going to be on sale first to uh, season ticket holders Tuesday, and then to uh, we think to the general public on Wednesday. They're going to go fast. Get them, but get your vaccine if you don't have it already. And finally, let's see. Just the last word about the Knicks. It couldn't. I know it's been a long time. Believe me, I know it's been a long time. <laughs> um, people tell me every day. Um, but we're back. We're in the playoffs. And it couldn't come at a better time for New York. Right. I hope our, our team does well, and I hope we lift the spirits of New York, and especially with this, this announcement, catapults us into a fantastic summer. The, thank you, Governor. The, uh, that's really what our venues are about, by the way. We're bringing people together, and we can't wait to get back to doing what we do best. Governor, we really, really appreciate this today. Like I said, I've been waiting 14 months for this. Yeah. This is the best. Um, this mar marks the moment when we start getting back to business, and hopefully all of New York gets back to business. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Well said. Let's give James Dolan and Jane Rosenthal a round of applause.
and Karen Hempel and the Roadrunners with the marathon coming back. Let's give her a round of applause. And uh, this is an exciting, exciting moment. It has been a dark, dark, hellish uh, year. Uh, something that we've never gone through before and, and pr hope to God that we never go through again. But that was yesterday, and we're looking at a different tomorrow. Uh, reopening New York, how do you reopen New York? It's not that simple, it's not one switch. You have to open the businesses, you have to open the offices, you have to open the subways, you have to open the buses, you have to open the restaurants, and you have to open the arts and the big cultural icons and sports. That's what makes New York, New York. It's not the buildings, it's not the roads, it's the spirit, it's the energy, it's the activity. Uh, that's what New York is all about. And that's what you see coming back to life today. So uh, thank you all very, very much. It's very exciting. I'm, I'm pleased and honored to be part of it. I want to applaud you, Jim and Jane and Karen for coming up to speed so quickly. I mean, these are massive operations that are now coming online. Normally, to say we're gonna open Radio City Music Hall, they would say, well, I need, you know, six months, I have to plan. Uh, but that New York mojo, that New York spirit says, uh, you tell me when and uh, we'll turn on the lights. Uh, and that's exactly what Mr. Dolan is doing. And I wanna thank him very much. Let's take questions from the press for Jane Rosenthal, Jim Dolan, or Karen Hempel. I'll then stay behind uh, and answer any questions uh, for myself uh, with Dr. Zucker and Robert Mejica. Um. Can you give me that without your mask on? Because I can't hear what you said. <laughs> and the governor says it's okay. <laughs> it's a big place. Yes, we're going to, and for the basketball games too. The 50 percent was a guideline, but as the governor pointed out, it's up to us, and we're going higher. The, um, the, the, look, we, we're going to still make room for people who are unvaccinated, but honestly, the, 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 uh, um, we're going to favor the vaccinated. The, the, uh, and at Radio City, we'll go to 100 percent vaccinated. The, the, uh, um, you know, the, the, I understand there are some people who are reluctant, et, et cetera, right? This is a reason why you should get vaccinated so you can participate in the culture and the things that you love about New York. Get vaccinated and then come. Yeah, and just let me, Zach, I applaud Mr. Dolan's point. Uh, we have slowed down on the vaccinations, as you know, and that's a problem. We have to get more people vaccinated. We are working very hard to come up with incentives to get people vaccinated, right? First, accessibility. We have mobile vaccine sites. We're going to churches. We're going to public housing projects. And now we're actually offering incentives to get a vaccine. That's the MTA. You get a vaccine, you get a free Metro Pass. Uh, so we're offering an incentive. Here's another incentive. It's nothing to do with government. Private venues I encourage them to have a high percentage available for vaccinated people. Radio City is going to be 100 percent. I encourage that because that's an incentive to get vaccinated. And we need more people vaccinated. Uh, and in some ways, uh, I think the private sector can offer more effective incentives than government can. You know, I'm, I'm limited in government. Uh, we have a few other ideas that we're poking around, but uh, being able to go to Radio City Music Hall, being able to go to a Knicks playoff game, that's, that's a real incentive. 
Radio City, um, 5,500. That's a really good question. I have no idea. <laughs> we just, the, the uh, you know, we, we just started this, the, the uh, we will be working with the state and we'll figure out a way the, the, uh, um, for it to happen. But yeah. I'm just, I'm just, you're ahead of me. <laughs> the state protocol, just so you know, is when you got vaccinated, you got a card. Uh, you could also have the Empire Pass, which is on your smartphone. But on a vaccinated venue, you will be asked or can be asked to produce that card and proof of vaccination. Well, you have uh, an Excelsior Pass app or you have a card, one or the other. I have a card. I don't have the app. I have a card. Uh, so it can be the Excelsior Pass or the card, but you have to show that when you enter the, the venue. Or if you're asked, you have to present that. In other words, the Empire State Pass is an app, so you have to have an iPhone, uh, and it's convenient, I understand. You have some dinosaurs who still walk around with cards, and they would have to present the card. Did I get that right, Rob? Yeah, it's, a, it's available to, on any smartphone, so it's the Excelsior Pass. Turn your button off. Okay. It's the Excelsior Pass. Uh, it's available on any of the app stores for either either phones. It's also available, you could also get it on any computer and you can print it out. So you'll be able to just get online, get your electronic uh, Excelsior Pass. You can print it out if you do not have a smartphone. You can use that. There's a QR code on it that you'll be able to use to present as proof of your vaccination. And then also, you also will have your card. So we will issue guidance for the large venues that, um, that uh, outlines you know, what are the, the requirements. But we do have both of those options. One's more convenient than the other, but it doesn't, and you could have paper or electronic version. So the state is saying that there will be some form of proof that you were vaccinated to get into Radio City or MSG. For the large venues, there will be, right, they will have to show. And that, just to be clear, that has been going on right now. So right now, there are venues that have been operating uh, in Madison Square Garden and others where there is an option for testing and or proof of vaccination. So people have been, thousands and thousands of people have used the Excelsior Pass and or shown proof of vaccination so far. So this is not something that's new. What's new would be that it's 100% of all people in those places, so you have to 100% vaccinated. But we've tested this, it started all the way in, back in Durham and the Buffalo Bills made the playoffs. That was the first start of this, so it's been going on since then. Um, this is just the culmination of that. Mr. Dolan, just to, uh, just to clarify, when you say 100% vaccinated at Radio City Music Hall, are you referring to just that Tribeca uh, final no. for every event leader? Yes. As a foreseeable future? Yes. Mr. Dolan, you said earlier if vaccinated folks would be favored at mix and concert, uh, concert events. Does that mean the unvaccinated will be in the, the worst seats in the house, essentially? Yeah. <laughs> I don't, I don't, we don't actually know. We haven't, we haven't scaled the house. We're working with different scenarios on it. But, I mean, look, the, the, uh, as the governor said, you know, we're going to favor vaccinated fans. Uh, so, you know, it doesn't mean we're going to put all the unvaccinated up in the very top of the garden, right? But the... the uh, I mean, the biggest thing with it is that if you really want to go see the game, right, the availability of tickets is going to be better than 10 to 1 in favor of vaccinating. Yeah, favored in terms of majority of the attendees, right? You're, so you're favored, you have more of a chance of getting a ticket if you are vaccinated than unvaccinated because there'll be more vaccinated tickets. I mean, the reason I asked is that we saw what happened with the Yankees and the Mets where they put the vaccinated sections up at the top of the upper deck. And I know Governor Yu had said that the unvaccinated wouldn't be stuck in the nosebleeds. 
turns out that that's what happened to the vaccinated in baseball games. The vaccinated got, I, I, I'm not familiar with what they did. The, We're going to see. The, 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 we haven't, you know, it's a fairly new announcement and we, you know, we have to do what's called scale the house scale the house, uh, which we're going to actually do today. So we'll have an answer for you probably in 24 hours or so. Regarding the Excelsior Pass, I just signed up for one, and I was very surprised that it doesn't require any kind of proof. It's based on self-reporting. You ask you, did you get a vaccine? You say yes. You ask me what date was your last dose, you put that in. Anyone can fill that out and get what would then be accepted as proof of vaccination. Is that a concern? Yeah, I don't believe that's correct. I believe it's verified. So it's actually very, it's actually the exhaustion pass is running up against the state's uh, license system that has a record of everyone's vaccinations. So when you enter that information, it's actually running up against the state system, which is confirming that you have gotten a vaccine. Okay. It's transparent. It's for privacy reasons. The only thing it transmits back is actually a yes or a no, and that's it. It doesn't okay. give out any more information. It was yes. run against the database. And if you were lying, it would have sent you a big L back. <laughs> One more from Mr. Dolan, if you don't mind. Uh, one of the governor's big goals so far has been to redevelop Penn Station, make a new Penn Station. Advocates have long said that the one way to get in, uh, the Penn Station that New York deserves is the Madison Square Garden to move. How open would you be to that prospect? We continue to work with the governor's office on, on all of his plans for the area. For the, uh, we're still looking at many scenar scenarios, and that I won't say one, ver one versus the other. Um, but you know, our intention is to continue to work, work with the state and to help them achieve what the governor wants to achieve, which is you know, build the Empire State Building all over again. Or what was the other one? Um, or Radio, Radio City. City. Right. The, the, I, I agree with his vision, very much so. And uh, as Mr. Dolan said, we've had uh, very good discussions. We have a good relationship. And it's in everyone's best interest, right? Uh, when we talk about expanding Penn, 780 block next door, Moynihan train hall, uh, we want more people coming into the city. You get more people on trains, more people coming in. It's a better experience. It's good for Madison Square Garden. It's good for the west side of Manhattan. It's good for everyone. Because if I don't give people notice, my job is a thankless job. Whatever you do, someone is going to complain. This is a radical adjustment of rules and guidelines. Uh, it was radical when the CDC put it out, frankly, last week and uh, caught people by surprise. So uh, we took a couple of days to analyze what it would be. We aligned it with our guidance. We're announcing that today. We're then giving vendors, uh, local governments, n notice today. It goes into effect Wednesday, so they have a day to uh, make adjustments. I'm sure they'll say it's too fast. They need more than a day, but uh, that's where we are. Yeah, no, it's a very good question. Uh, it is up to them. Now, the Empire Pass, which is a really great thing, we were the first state to do it. I don't know that we're the only state that has it. Uh, but the Empire Pass is very easy to get. Uh, they can check. They can ask uh, at the door. They can ask when you're seated at the table. Um, uh, or not. Uh, there is no mandatory compliance by, uh, that the state is imposing on the private ven vendors. I will bet you this. I will bet you when you go to a restaurant and you're sitting next to a person who has no mask, uh, people are going to ask the r restaurant owner, did you check to make sure this person was vaccinated. You know, just because you say today, okay, you don't need this anymore, 
this has gone beyond government rules and regulations. People have inculcated this into their psyche. Uh, I've had more people ask me, are you saying I can't wear a mask anymore because I still want to wear a mask? Uh, I expect there are going to be a lot of people who are not just going to uh, flick a switch and be over this. I think there's going to be lingering concern, et cetera. So, and I think you're going to see a lot of people wearing masks uh, going forward. But it is up to the private vendor, private venue. I would suspect the customers are going to be asking those private uh, vendors what they did. I'm sure when people come into Radio City Music Hall, they're going to ask, I'm sitting next to someone, I don't know who they are, are you sure they were vaccinated? And uh, that's why it's on the operator's uh, best interest to be able to say, yes, I checked the Empire State Pass. If they didn't have a pass, they had a card, but they were checked when they walked in the door. I don't expect all people to be dropping them. Dev. See, I think this is interesting. I don't think it has anything to do with, you know, I did COVID briefings every day for like ever. It wasn't the rules. Government can't tell you to wear a mask. I can't. I can say it. Wear a mask. You say no. And then what is government going to do? It's not that they, f they adhered to the rule because it was a rule. It was because I gave them the rationale and the ex explanation that said, it's smart for you to wear a mask. That was more powerful than the rules, you know? They heard, they looked at the numbers, they processed the information, and they came to a decision in their judgment. Well, CDC says you don't need a mask. And New York State followed CDC. They're going to do the same thing. They're going to say, that's nice, CDC said that, and that's nice, the New York State Commission of Health said that, but I'm going to process it myself. And you know what? I think I'm going to keep wearing a mask because I'm not 100% sure about this. So, yeah, it goes into effect Wednesday. I will wager you on your, your walk to work, at least 40% of the people are still wearing masks. $10. Be honest on the count. No, videotape your walk, as a matter of fact. <laughs> Anything else for Jim or Jane or Karen? Okay, I'll let them go. Give us a minute. Give them a round of applause. Thank you. Look at you. You have everything going on there. Everything. 
And you're in Radio City Musical. <laughs> sure. Where are you from? Argentina. Uh, anyone can come and be vaccinated here in New York and receive proof of vaccination, and that proof works anywhere in the state. Is that right? And now they cannot, if they go uh, to the website, and they put their address in Argentina, they get rejected. So they come and they walk in. Rob? We have walk-ins now. We do have, have walk-ins now and on the address, but we'll work on the technology issue and make sure that they can reflect that. The issue is that the technology was designed for New Yorkers to make sure that it goes into our system and then there's a, and there's a record. Because they're not residents, we, they don't get put into the nicest system. So we're working, we're working on that. This is a new announcement. Right now with a passport at those sites, but not every site right, has gotten all of the instructions for it because it's mostly a New York City issue, but we're, we're working on it. Yeah. Well, uh, we don't know exactly when that ends. We're going to see. This has never been done before. None of this has ever been done before. but. These pop-ups in the vaccination in the uh, subway stations has just started last week. It worked very well. We extended it. If it continues to work well, we're going to extend it more. But besides the subways, we have pop-up sites uh, everywhere. Uh, let's, let's just talk some facts, okay? Because uh, I don't want to, I want to be productive. Uh, we have to get New York City back. That is a more complicated equation than it suggests. The obvious is open the businesses, open the offices, restaurants, uh, but that's not enough. You also have to deal with the fact of where New Yorkers are now and the damage that has been done during COVID. Damage has been done. Damage has been done to school children, and I believe that has to be rectified when they get back to school. Damage has been done to businesses. Uh, so you have to correct for the damage and you have to improve New York because you have many doubters out there. You had doubters after 9-11, which I mentioned, but you have doubters today. You have a lot of doubters who say, you know what, New York, uh, it's not worth it. Uh, the crime rate, homelessness, taxes, uh, I moved to Florida, to Aspen, to North Carolina, to the Hamptons, to the Hudson Valley during COVID, and you know what? It's okay, and I can do this remote learning. We have to attract them back. The burden is on us. And a big piece of it, step back, come back for Radio City Music Hall. You don't get that in the Hamptons. And you don't get that in Florida. Come back for the Tribeca Film Festival. Come back for the Hudson River. Come back for the restaurants. Best on the globe. And come back because it's safe. Come back because it's safe. If you don't have it is safe, you don't have anything. You don't have anything. The MTA 
is not perfect, has never been perfect, will never be perfect. Uh, few of us have attained that goal. Only one person in history. The, and he wouldn't even claim that he achieved perfection. The MTA has made tremendous pro progress, and you know it. It is cleaner, the schedule and the performance rate is better than ever. The main problem the MTA has is crime. That's the main problem. It has been for quite some time. It has been pre-COVID. I said pre-COVID two years ago, the MTA should stop asking for the New York City to put more police officers, hire their own police. What was that, two years ago, three years ago? Two years. Two years ago. Hire 500 more police. We needed that two years ago. And MTA was asking, MTA was asking, MTA was asking. Nothing was happening. I said the MTA should fire, hire 500 more police. There was opposition. We don't need more police. We have too many police. The defund police movement. You remember the videos of NYPD officers arresting people on trains in a very harsh way that went viral. So there was a, a psyche and a mentality that said, we don't want more police. Defund all police. We don't need any police. Police are the problem, not the solution. I said the MTA should hire 500 more police. They have been hiring the police. The crime on the subways now is a major, major problem. How do you deny that? So the mayor now, I don't know exactly what he said, but to the extent he said, I'm going to send more police, at least that's an acknowledgment of the problem, right? Now, uh, are the number of police that he sent enough? I don't think so because I think we have been under-policed for quite some time. You go back and look at the staffing rate that the, was in the subways in like the mid-90s. We're below that. You know you have a crime problem in the subways. You need more police. And it's not just crime in the subways, it's crime, period. That's why I say to these mayoral candidates, you wanna be mayor of New York? If I'm a New York City born and raised, I don't vote in New York City anymore. My first question to the mayoral candidates, what are you gonna do about crime? Specifically, how many police? How many police in the subways? What are you going to do about crime in the subways? What changes would you make? What changes do you think you'd make? I tried to prompt that conversation by saying every city had to do a reform plan on public safety. By April 1, New York City put in its reform plan. It had some nice uh, initiatives, but it is not a fundamental reform plan. And that has to be the question for the next mayor. The state does what the state can do. What is the responsibility of the city? Police, fire, sanitation, run the schools pursuant to state law. All those things are pursuant to state law. But those are the services controlled by the city. And of police, fire, sanitation, run the schools, pursuant to state law, police is a paramount importance, especially today. Crime is a major problem in the city. Crime is a major problem in the MTA. The MTA, for the first time, increased the number of police the MTA was hiring. They did that as a last resort. 
NYPD, finest police department in the country. We'll put them in the subways. But to the extent the mayor has acknowledged that crime is a problem in the subways, I say amen. I have. I have. I have. But to give you an idea, we have about 5,000 state police. There are about 30,000 NYPD. What are the exact numbers? Do you remember the numbers? Over 30, about 34, over 30. Over 30. Over 30,000. Over 30,000. 30, 30, 5,000 state police for the state. I have assigned them to New York City. We did two things. We had the, gave money to the MTA to hire more police, and we sent in more state troopers. We have state police in train stations. We have state police uh, throughout the city. You see state police cars now. You've never seen the state police in New York City before. You never saw that. When I was growing up, I never saw a state police car in New York City. Never happened. So that's everything we can do. More troopers, uh, more MTA police. Yeah, yeah. There is a legal definition of harassment that is very clear. All I was saying is just uncomfortable does not uh, mean sexual harassment. You make me uncomfortable by some of the questions you ask me. That is not sexual harassment. There are other elements that also have to be added. <laughs> yes. Intimate, you mean sexual relationship. Well, don't just read the question. <laughs> you have to know basically what it means. Intimate has a number of uh, manifestations. I think we have an intimate relationship. Don't you think that? Yeah. Not a sexual relationship. <laughs> no, no. Made you uncomfortable <laughs> with that question, didn't I? Obviously, if someone's uncomfortable in certain settings, it's not harassment. However, the question is about you as a boss speaking to an employee about sexual issues. Is that just making the employee uncomfortable, or is that harassment? No, there is a legal definition of is harassment. Definition yeah, I'll send it to you. No, so, you two paragraphs. Right Yes. Uh, if you read the Goer Handbook on Sexual Harassment. Oh, it is, what is it? I'm not, on, I'm not the one asking. You're not the one asking. Yeah, well, I'm asking you. What do you think it is? I'm asking you. What is it just making someone uncomfortable? Because that's what you said last week. All right. Uh, yes, I know the definition. I know the definition and I never sexually harassed anyone. I am going to, I, let me finish the question, uh, answer. Uh, I let them do the review, and then I'm going to tell you the truth and the facts about this entire situation that uh, it has been, uh, I think, distorted in the press and manipulated, and when the time is right, I will tell you the truth and the facts, and I am very much looking forward to it. Luis, I want to hear 
as a New Yorker uh, from the candidates on their positions. Number of issues matter to me. Uh, number one issue to me right now is uh, what is their plan on fighting crime? What is their plan on fighting crime? And specifics, specifics. See, when you are mayor, when you are an executive, there is no conceptual. Conceptually, I'm against crime, and I believe we have to reduce crime, and conceptually, I believe in community-based policing, and conceptually, I want a better relationship between the community and the police, and conceptually, yeah, I understand that. What are you going to do? What needs to be done? Do you need more police? How many police would you put in the subway? Uh, what laws do you need? What laws that the state passed need to be modified, if any? What would you do? That is the sine qua non, is public safety. Can we bring back Radio City Music Hall? Yes. Can we bring back Tribeca? Yes. Can we bring back restaurants? Yes. Can we reopen small businesses? Yes. We're funding that. Can you get tenants relief? Yes. Can you move quickly and show a new future? Yes. Come to the Pier 76 opening. Come to look at the new Moynihan train hall. Come to look at the new Penn Station. Come to look at the new Belmont Arena. Come to look at the new Long Island Railroad track. Come to look at the new airports. Yes. But what the state does not control is crime and policing. And whatever we do, if people don't feel safe, it's not going to be enough. You look at the trajectory of the city's economy, and you look at the up periods and the down periods, you know what is the one constant? The rate of crime. Get people back on the subways. Get them vaccinated. They have to feel safe. They have to feel safe. Do they feel safe now? No. Uh, I don't want to comment on that at this time. I don't know what guidance he's referring to. You know, homelessness is complicated, but like anything in life, as complicated as it is, is as simple as it is. Uh, I've worked on the homeless issue all my life. I started in my 20s uh, when I was Housing and Urban Development Secretary under Clinton. I did a, ho a homeless plan for the entire country. I visited every state. Uh, we have to, the subways are no place for the homeless. The homeless can successfully be engaged and removed from the subways. We proved that last year when the subways were shut down and police came in and social workers came in and brought the homeless to a shelter. The shelter has to be safe. Otherwise, homeless people make a decision, the subway is safer than the shelter. I mean, I have conversations. There's a certain amount of rationality. The subways are safer than a shelter. That's a rational judgment. You have to have safe shelters, uh, which is a current problem in the city. And you need a mental health uh, component and a mental health facility that you can bring people back to. Handing pamphlets to people on the subway system 
as has been done over the past two years, call 1-800-FOR-HELP, that doesn't work. Do you know? No. No. No, there are not. No, no. there are not. No. Short answer is no. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys.